With GPU hardware, improvements in raw performance alone are not enough. Cranking up the clock frequencies, the amount of memory bandwidth, the number of shaders on a GPU core, and so on and so on, is, of course, fundamentally important, but we also need to see the GPUs do more work considering their relative performance. Basically, IPC and efficiency are the names of the game, not only because of pesky reasons like power consumption and heat output given a specific process, but furthermore, as you start to cram uh, more transistors onto a certain piece of silicon, as it gets bigger in other words, you have other constraints other than the power and heat, such as, well, yields. In other words, how many of the dyes are defective, which you can start to mitigate those costs by binning, i.e. Uh, if you have a certain number of defective compute units, for example, on a GPU, you could uh, bin it to a lower performance tier GPU, but even things like cost become prohibitive. Therefore, efficiency is ultimately the name of the game. We see that on both hardware and software fronts, and both are as imperative as one another. We've seen technology like hidden surface removal, data and color compression, for example, for years now, and the technologies continue to evolve, continue to evolve, continue to evolve. In the distant future, with NVIDIA's next generation, or shall I say next next generation GPU, given we're still waiting for the RTX 30 cards to launch based on the Ampere architecture, we are expecting NVIDIA to adopt an MCM type of design, aka chiplets, where several dies come together to form a larger whole. AMD, of course, have been pioneering this with the Ryzen series of CPUs on the Zen 2 and future architectures, and we expect them to do much the same with uh, later iterations of their own graphics lineup. And Intel are also doing the same thing, but because they're Intel, they have renamed them and they are calling them tiles, where several tiles come together to form an XE GPU, at least for the higher tier products. But Getting back to efficiency then, software and hardware both need to come together, and in this video I'd like to focus on VSR or variable rate shading, and explain what variable rate shading is, why it's important, and what type of uh, graphical impact it makes in games, as well as what type of performance impacts as well. Both the next generation consoles, as well as uh, uh, current generation GPUs from NVIDIA, and certainly next generation GPUs from AMD, and even Intel's GPUs support this tech. So what exactly is it? Let's dive in. Variable rate shading is one of those tech terms which pretty accurately describes the underlying technology. It shades, i.e. the process of the GPU drawing stuff, objects at varying amounts of quality, and depends on several criteria, but all with the same underlying goal, reducing the workload of the GPU so that what's important can have more needed detail, while other areas can be drawn at reduced quality, but in a way which shouldn't fundamentally impact the quality of the scene. Think of it this way. If you have an FPS game, are you more concerned with things in the far distant background, they're probably in motion and blurry anyway, such as a moving car or whatever, or more concerned by the big monster that's trying to eat your face. Also, it's a big monster, so probably blocking most of your view of the distance anyway. To be clear, this technology isn't the same thing as, say, DLSS, Deep Learning Super Sampling, from NVIDIA. DLSS renders the whole scene at a lower resolution internally, then uses AI to upsample it from that resolution to the output resolution. NVIDIA trains a neural network with high-resolution reference images with DLSS2 and up-samples the lower-resolution version produced in real-time against this higher-resolution content. The neural network generates hundreds if not thousands of results before eventually coming up with a result which looks close to, if not better in some cases, than a native image. This trained data is then able to run on your home GPU. By the way, the process of running trained slash learned data is known as inference, which requires less uh, capable hardware compared to actually training it, which requires a supercomputer. Therefore, this can then be bundled with your GeForce graphics driver as a small update and then can run on your home RTX card. 
I've gone over this more extensively in a previous video, I'll link it below. The next generation consoles are also pursuing upsampling tech as well, though its code apparently runs on the compute units of the GPU, and we don't also fully understand how this will affect performance and also quality. Remember, the same underlying tech appears to be in the next generation of AMD RDNA 2 GPUs as well, and much the same questions could be asked here as well, because NVIDIA have tensor cores to run the LSS2, so it will be interesting to see what AMD bring to the table there. Either way, getting back to VRS, it was first introduced by NVIDIA in a consumer-grade card with Turing. This was a feature known as NAS, NVIDIA Adaptive Shading. We saw Wolfenstein, Young Blood, feature both it as well as the LSS2. We'll go over the visual quality and performance in a moment. But this tech, VRS, is not limited to Turing and other uh, future architectures from NVIDIA. It's also been baked into the um, DirectX 12 Ultimate standard. But no, DX12 Ultimate isn't a special piece of tech here with their API from Microsoft. Industry standards are incredibly important to gain uh, support and adoption. And so other APIs can support VRS. For example, Kronos Group supports variable rate shading and other crucial DirectX 12 Ultimate tech such as mesh shaders and hardware-based ray tracing. We'll discuss Kronos and their approach of this in another video, but I have gone over some of this stuff with Neil Trevitt from uh, NVIDIA as well as Kronos in an interview. So you can check that video out if you would like. You can simply search Neil Trevitt interview on the channel. PlayStation 5 does not use DirectX 12 Ultimate because Sony have their own shader language. It's known as PlayStation Shader Language, PSSL, for their consoles. From what I understand, the next generation PlayStation takes a similar approach. PS4 uses FreeBSD for its operating system with two APIs, application programming interfaces, GNM and GNMX. The latter is a higher level language, which to handles more of the work and management, for example, manage, uh, management of memory by the API itself. Therefore, much of the inner workings and concern of the GPU are abstracted. GNM is a lower level variant of the API and is designed to code more directly to the hardware. Which route is best is down to you as a developer, with one being easier to work with but lower potential performance. But developers Doing simpler games, for example a 2D retro platformer, or even a 3D experience not fully maximizing the performance of the console, they could happily choose GNMX. From my digging and asking developers, the PlayStation 5 continues to use free BSD, but with large customization as before. There are, however, some of the same fundamentals in place, so developers should be reasonably up to speed. As for Microsoft, I'm hearing pretty good things of what they've done with the OS, and of course, it's essentially built on a version of the Windows Core. With Microsoft, they've also baked in DirectX 12 Ultimate into the console. Basically, they designed the Xbox Series X around this. From what I understand from developers, they are pleased with the access they've got to the hardware and how easy it is to develop on the system. It seems that the company have taken a lot of steps forward since the days of Xbox One. It also goes without saying that the uh, Xbox Series X can code to the metal, once again with DirectX 12 Ultimate, or choose a higher level approach. Just like PlayStation, it's going to be down to the developer on what approach is best. Either way, on top of VRS being supported by Turing, Intel can support it with Generation 11 and later iGPUs, and as you've probably gathered by now, AMD also supports it with RDNA 2 and later. So, what type of performance impact can you wrangle out of VRS being enabled? Well, unfortunately, as is always the case with these things, it's heavily dependent and influenced by several factors. The game engine being one of them, as well as the game itself, and 
then there's other things such as screen resolution, what's going on uh, in the game at that very moment, and so on and so on. Ultimately, though, VRS is a performance win, but it does heavily depend on several criteria. VRS works by taking parts of the image which are blurry, let's say with depth of field applied or experiencing some type of other motion blur, or maybe in the background or have been flagged by other means, perhaps by the developer, so that the quality loss won't be really imperceptible to the entire image. For example, if you're racing around a track and trying not to get shot in the face is another example. Long story short, all pixels or objects in a scene are not created of equal value, and therefore intelligently selecting which parts of the image get the most love is vital for not only performance but, strangely, visual quality too. You don't want to put in as much work into shading, say, a road sign which is far off in the distance, probably heavily blurred, as opposed to, let's say, the road in front of you or other close-by objects, which have much more of an impact in the visual quality of a scene. Microsoft, for their credit, describes VRS pretty well. For each pixel in a screen, shaders are called to calculate the color that that pixel should be. Shading rate refers to the resolution at which these shaders are called, which is different from overall screen resolution. A higher shading rate means more visual fidelity, but a higher GPU cost. A lower shading rate means the opposite, lower visual fidelity, that comes at the lower GPU cost. With older hardware running traditional effects, this cannot be done. The scene is essentially all being shaded at the same rate. This obviously wastes performance, which could go over on a better frame rate, or improving the visual elements of the scene which do contribute more to the overall quality. Okay, now we know what VRS actually is, what about the quality, and is there much of a loss with VRS enabled, and how's about performance? Let's start things out with 3D Mark first, since it has a built-in tool to test performance. And there's also a few handy features with this benchmark. For one, you can turn it on and off, that is VRS, as the demo is running. And you can also check out various quality settings. Plus, you can even hold the demo at specific frames. So, what about the answer? How does variable rate shading look? Well, you can see for yourself, there's definitely a lot of detail when VRS is enabled. Even at the higher quality settings, but it's much more noticeable, as you could imagine, with static frames. This is because, of course, your eye has a chance to process the drop in quality. We're looking at VRS Tier 2 here. When the highest performance mode is enabled, the drop in detail starts to take away from the image. Of course, this is also a kind of best case or worst case scenario, depending on how you're looking at this. It's a very aggressive type of optimization, and it's not something that would really be used in a AAA game, at least for foreground objects which aren't dealing with excessive motion blur. This instead is more of a proof of concept, and shows how scalable VRS is. But what about performance? Well, we're using an RTX 2080 Ti and a Ryzen 7 3700X motherboard for our testing. I'd also like to take a moment to thank everyone on Patreon for contributing here, as your funds have helped us purchase this hardware, which of course naturally means your support makes these videos possible. If you'd like to contribute, you can find our link in the description, or alternatively just use Amazon affiliate links, or you can just subscribe and of course share the video, as it helps us out a ton. Anyway, back to the video itself, rather than plugging, 40 to 60% improvement with the built-in benchmark is what you'll see. In raw frames a second, the numbers are already pretty huge. As I said a second ago, the scene isn't exactly super complicated. I will say though that in both tier 1 and tier 2 VRS, no resolutions offer a higher performance bump. Not surprising given that there's more pixels to work on, and also you're dealing with less bottlenecks in the system, such as the CPU. I'll say again, the scene is not very complicated, and the scathing here is extremely high because of this. Once again, this is definitely a best case scenario for a VRS workload. 
Switching to Gears Tactics, which is, as the name would imply, a new entry in the Gears universe, and it launched fairly recently with VRS support. It's also part, of course, of um, uh, Xbox Game Pass for PC. It's a pretty fun game. Anyway, we're testing again with an RTX 2080 Ti, and we're also throwing in the RTX 2060 Super into the mix. I'd like to thank MSI for chipping in here with the RTX 2060 Super, so go to their UK social media and thank them for me if you would. Oh, and of course the Ryzen 7 3700X is also the CPU of choice. For this test, I've decided to punish the GPU. I'm testing at 1080p, 1440 and finally 4K, with the exception of the RTX 2080 Ti. I threw out the 1080p results because honestly the card is just so fast, there's not much point. Also, I've pushed all of their settings to the highest, that is Ultra, and I've also opted to enable both planar and glossy graphics options. In theory, again, this should mean that the GPU has a serious workout. Gears 3 has free settings for VRS, disabled on maximum performance, with obviously maximum performance being the lowest visual quality, but, well, the most performance. I'll let you judge on the visuals yourself as we're uh, switching here, but my personal opinion, I think that the visuals don't suffer anywhere near as much as the artificial results found in 3D Mark. However, if you do turn things to maximum performance, you'll notice a lot more aggressive cutting in terms of the visual quality versus just on. But, of course, depending on your hardware, it may be worth the trade-off. As for performance, the 2060 Super raises in performance about 10% with VRS enabled at 1440p. This sets well within the 60fps comfort zone on average, and 1440p on the 2080 Ti, it just doesn't really need VRS enabled, unless you really want to push high frame rates and a high refresh rate display. And how much mileage you'll get with a game like Gears Tactics doing that, well, I'll leave that down to you. 4K though, can't quite hit 60 FPS, though bear in mind a few frames were CPU bound for the 3700X, and furthermore the 2080 Ti was running at stock, just like the CPU actually. I'm sure if you did go in, crank power limits, clock frequencies, yada yada yada, you could hit 60 FPS with VRS set to performance, but for this I've decided not to do that, I wanted to be as representative to an out-of-the-box experience as you could be. Finally, we have Wolfenstein, which, as I mentioned earlier, has DLSS tech with it. I've previously tested DLSS 2 in a further video, and I'll link to it, but long story short, DLSS 2 has a pretty substantial performance advantage over VRS. You cannot also enable DLSS and VRS well, at the same time. So for those wondering, at least in their current implementation, they do not stack. I've also run the built-in benchmark here. The results are consistent, but they also are not too punishing. As full disclosure, these benchmarks were taken with slightly different hardware. I used an i9-9900K clocked to 5GHz and an ASRock motherboard, which was provided by both companies respectively, and also I do not have 2080 Ti results here, instead I have the 2060 Super and the 2070 Super. Uh, the reason that this is the case is because I built the i9 system for the purposes of a ray tracing analysis which is coming soon, and also the aforementioned DLSS coverage. And given I've torn down the i9-9900K system, because I'm currently building a, a couple of test systems for the 10th generation, I just didn't want to put everything back together for just a couple of benchmarks, and obviously I don't want to use a different CPU, as that would also kind of skew results. So here we are. Anyway, visually VRS looks really good in this game. I personally think DLSS looks amazing, DLSS 2, even at lower resolution. Once again, you could check the video if you want an in-depth explanation of this, but I personally believe that DLSS, you really could not tell that it's enabled, especially at the higher quality settings. It almost is 
free, I suppose you could say, performance. But with that said, variable rate shading also looks really damn good. A key benefit of Wolfenstein for both DLSS and VRS is that you're generally running around and it's a fast paced game, meaning that you don't really have time to really analyze the background elements, especially as they're blurred or you're being shot at. So visually, at least in my opinion, during actual gameplay, difference visually is not ultra perceptible with VRS enabled. Frame rate wise though, the benchmark, as I said earlier, is not the most punishing, but it does offer a nice uh, performance boost with VRS enabled, although nowhere near as much as with DLSS. There are several presets with VRS, however, and as usual, you can go in and crank things and change performance as you wish, but you can also manually tweak things with sliders, should you so desire. To close things out, VRS has a cousin of sorts. It's actually based on very similar technology with VRS as an underlying component. I'm keeping things simple here before people yell at me in the comments. But long story short, you can basically say that foveated rendering is a cousin of sorts of VRS using similar tech. Let me explain a little. I have gone over foveated rendering before, so I don't want to focus on it too much. And boy, if you know what foveated rendering is... You've just had a pretty good laugh at that joke. Anyway, foveated rendering is a tech which is designed for virtual reality and was created to improve performance of an application. VR amps are more sensitive to latency, lower frame rate, and, well, to keep things simple again, you can just feel not too well if frame rates are low and jerky. And by not too well, I mean you feel like puking. Foveated rendering is a tech which tracks the fovea in the eye. And it sees what's in focus, you get the joke now, and in your peripheral vision. Or to put it another way, it uses tracking to see what your eye is focused on and renders that part of the image at a higher resolution slash shading, to be more precise. And stuff that's in your peripheral vision, it reduces the quality on. Objects in peripheral vision can be seen in less detail in real life. You can check this out yourself. Have like a phone in one hand and a book in the other hand, about equal distance from your face, but hold it slightly apart from one another. Focus on one of them, it doesn't matter which. Then with your focus locked, try with your brain to make out the content in the other object. Once again, don't shift your focus, just try to look using your peripheral vision. It's very hard to do so. Foveated rendering has been spotted in numerous Sony patents, along with perhaps one of the most disturbing patent images ever, Maybe I just play too much Dead Space. And foveated rendering is also not a unique special snowflake to Sony. NVIDIA have been discussing it extensively too, as have Intel. Um, Microsoft have also been pushing foveated rendering and so on and so on. We've said this multiple times on the channel before, but you can't just take a T-flop figure and run with it and say that that's how powerful a particular card is. And it's even more difficult to compare a T-flop figure versus of one architecture versus another, especially if it's a few generations older. Let's pick on Microsoft for a moment, the Xbox Series X, and compare it against the Xbox One X. The two GPUs, well, one of them has six T-flops, one of, of them has 12 T-flops, 6 is half of 12, so that's how powerful the Xbox Series X is. Twice as powerful as the Xbox One X, right? No, of course, that's a lot of crap. The Xbox Series X is magnitude more powerful than the Xbox One X. Not only do you have a much faster SSD and CPU, which doesn't really play into occasion necessarily all the time or for graphics performance, but even if you just compare the raw GPU, not only do you have considerably more memory bandwidth, including effective memory bandwidth with way more uh, color compression, uh, much better uh, IPC in terms of how much data can be processed per clock, but furthermore, other tech such as variable rate shading, hardware-based ray tracing, variable uh, mesh shaders, and so much more besides. Ultimately, variable rate shading, closing this video off, is not a piece of tech which is going to double, treble your frame rates. But it is going to be interesting to see how it evolves over the next several years, particularly given it will most likely be joined along with tech such as AI upsampling to really make the most out of uh, the performance of hardware and, of course, to scale across different scenarios of games.
ultimately, it's very difficult to predict where we're going to be in the future. But if we know anything from the history of graphics, developers and engineers are extremely uh, smart at getting the most out of hardware and designing hardware to be as efficient as possible. I think that in the next couple of years, graphics are going to start changing to not just rely on things like a native resolution as the be all and end all as the mark of quality, but also many other criteria as well. It's not just how many pixels are in a scene, but the quality of those pixels. And with something like AI upsampling, you're taking the base resolution and then upsampling it to a final output resolution. Basically, technology like variable rate shading, AI upsampling, and so much more besides is going to be a critical thing for the next generation consoles. With all of that said, though, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, because it helps us out a ton. You can also find links to Patreon in the video description. So do know that, of course, if you do contribute, your contributions do help make these videos possible, after all. As I've uh, discussed a couple of times now, uh, things such as the RTX uh, 2080 Ti, as well as the um, 2700X, have been purchased by your Patreon contribution. So thank you to everyone who has been contributing. And also there are Amazon affiliate links if you are buying something on Amazon and want to help the channel out that way. And if not, that is totally cool. Even if you just share the video on social media, that is amazing. Thank you very much for watching the video. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.